panelists who are going to be presenting are all colleagues mm -hmm. of ours at the University of Minnesota, but um, they have also been curriculum developers for a project that we have at Carlos, an initiative called Social Justice in Language Education. And I know that our presenters are going to be sharing information about that initiative, but I'm just going to put in the chat a link to the homepage for the Social Justice Initiative so that you can see all of the work that's been going on here at Carla. Um, but our four panelists have each created a multi-week curricular unit on a social justice topic, um, and each of their units relates to the topic of identity in different ways, and that's what they'll be talking about today. So our presenters are Stephanie Anderson, who is a senior teaching specialist in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies, Nadia Clayton, who is a senior lecturer of Russian in the Department of German, Nordic, Slavic, and Dutch. Sarah Finney, who is a senior lecturer and the Intermediate Spanish Coordinator in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies. And Ashley Henry, who is a lecturer and coordinator of first year French in the Department of French and Italian. And the title of their presentation today is Exploring Identity through social justice pedagogies. Before I turn things over to Ashley, I just wanna let you know that the chat is open. We welcome you to use it for back channeling and also to ask questions and I'll facilitate uh, Q and A at the end of the presentation. Okay, Ashley, on to you. All right, well, thank you everyone. Uh, my colleagues and I are very happy to be with you today and to share about our social justice uh, curricular units. And as Kate was saying, each of these units explore a social justice theme that is relevant to the communities that speak the languages that we teach. More specifically, each unit explores questions of identity from multiculturalism, diversity and inclusion in Russia to how slam poetry can give voice to marginalized people in Brazil, to linguistic security and pride in Francophone Louisiana, <clears throat> and to finally how art across the Spanish speaking world can inspire social action and express uh, one's identity. In our presentation today, we will first give a very brief uh, background of how these units came to be, what context they are designed to be used in, and the social justice standards that framed how we approach these topics. Then each presenter will give a brief overview of their unit and explain how one or two of the social justice standards are made tangible through, um, through either an activity or an assessment from their unit. Finally, we will conclude with information about where to find these open source units and a brief show and tell of how to navigate the materials. On the last slide of this presentation, we will share the link to this slideshow and the link to all four units, so you'll have access to everything that you see today. So um, as far as how the units came to be, these units and others are an outcome of Carlo's Social Justice and Language uh, Education Initiative, um, which seeks to, quote, improve teachers' understanding and application of critical pedagogies as they teach social justice themes. Um, using a multi-literacies approach, the units are designed uh, for intermediate level language learners, and they have been piloted or implemented in our third or fourth semester language courses here at the University of Minnesota. Um, each unit is guided by a few essential questions, explores a range of target language texts, and evaluates learners' progress through formative and summative assessments. Additionally, these units share a common framework for ad addressing social justice in the classroom. That is the social justice standards from the organization Learning for Justice. These standards are organized into four main domains, identity, diversity, justice, and action, that seek to equip students with the knowledge and skills that they will need to both reduce prejudice and contribute to collective action. To briefly summarize each domain, identity standards, um, they uh, urge, or they, um, uh, excuse me, uh, to briefly summarize each one, briefly standards seek to explore the complexities of cultures and how students negotiate their own identity in and out of these spaces. Diversity standards seek to examine diversity with accuracy, depth, and respect. And the justice standards recognize the impacts of injustice, bias, power, and privilege, whereas the action standards explore making principled decisions about when and how to take a stand and then carrying out each of each collect um, to carrying out such collective actions. In today's presentation, each presenter will choose one or two social justice standards and explain how their unit incorporated this standard in either an activity or an assessment. As you learn about these units, if the unit is not designed for the language that you teach, um, we hope that it will spark inspiration for how a similar social justice theme could be incorporated into your own classrooms. And with that, we will um, turn our attention to the first unit. Uh, Nadia Clayton will present her unit titled Multicultural Diversity of Russia, A Journey from Moscow to Dagestan. Hi, my name is uh, Nadia Clayton and I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of German, Nordic, Slavic and Dutch. Um, I'd like to say a few words about how this project came to be materialized for me. 
I've been teaching for many years, over 25 years, and needless to say, throughout the years, I've tried many different uh, textbooks and noticed that none of them contain the chapter on the multicultural diversity of Russia. Uh, it has always struck me as a major oversight, <clears throat> considering that this is uh, one of the most fascinating and important aspects of uh, Russian culture and history. Uh, so when the department approached me about participating in the social skills project, I seized the, uh, this opportunity to create a unit on multicultural diversity of Russia and to incorporate social justice standards more explicitly in my classrooms. My unit is entitled uh, Multicultural Diversity of Russia, a journey from Moscow to Dagestan. And uh, uh, it takes uh, students on a journey from the heart of Russia's capital, Moscow, to the Republic of Dagestan in the south of Russia, which is the most multinational uh, region of uh, Russia, not only Russia, of uh, Europe in general, populated by more than 60 different ethnicities. Uh, the unit uh, consists of uh, uh, three chapters, um, uh, Introduction to the Multicultural Diversity of Russia, Moscow Multicultural Quilt, and Dagestan Multinational Treasury. All in all, we spent 15 days working on the unit, and it uh, uh, culminated uh, in the action-oriented summative uh, assessment. Um, in this presentation, I'd like to focus on the chapter dedicated to Dagestan. Uh, the uh, essential question that guides this chapter is how important is the preservation of national traditions and languages uh, for our identity? And the diversity and social justice standards I highlight in this chapter are the following, examining um, <clears throat> diversity in social, cultural, political, and historical contexts rather than in ways that are superficial or oversimplified, and to recognize stereotypes uh, and uh, relate to people as individuals rather than <clears throat> um, representatives of groups. Why I've decided to focus on Dagestan for the exploration of these themes is that the region is, uh, as I've already mentioned, one of the most multinational regions um, uh, of Russia, populated by more than 60 different ethnicities. It is also very uh, religiously diverse, uh, three religious, uh, religions uh, practice there, uh, Islam, Christianity, and uh, Judaism, and uh, uh, 14 national languages are spoken um, uh, in this area. So I'd like to um, uh, share some uh, activities with you uh, that uh, uh, students enjoyed uh, during our pilot uh, project um, in uh, um, one of the activities, uh, students are asked to closely uh, examine several sites and uh, uncover how they work to preserve and protect the Dagestani national culture, guided by uh, some uh, reflection questions. And in these reflection questions, students um, are asked to um, uh, think about uh, uh, how these sites uh, relate to the problem of preserving and protecting the national uh, culture of Dagestan, what solutions are uh, proposed on the sites in relation to these problems, and uh, um, <clears throat> what elements of the national culture of Dagestan require special attention and protection um, based on the site information. Uh, the students are also um, <clears throat> encouraged to um, uh, uh, think uh, about uh, uh, similar sites uh, in their um, uh, native uh, countries and states and uh, what can be learned uh, from sites like that and how important is the preservation of national traditions and languages uh, uh, for our identity. Uh, in uh, um, another activity, uh, students uh, offered uh, to watch uh, a video and the video uh, talks uh, about um, <clears throat> Uh, the uh, uh, importance of preservation of the uh, ethnic um, uh, languages. Uh, uh, it also uh, discusses uh, the question that the Russian language plays a very important unifying role as lingua franca. However, there are certain unique problems and challenges that arise from such a multilingual atmosphere. Uh, and students are offered to view uh, a video and write down at least three issues. Uh, and discussed in it. Uh, the video also talks uh, um, about certain stigma that uh, quite often uh, is attached to these small uh, ethnicities and languages. They're viewed as uh, sometimes uh, too conservative uh, and significant and having nothing to contribute uh, to the dominant culture. Uh, and the students work together uh, to challenge this misconception and try to come up with several solutions 
in regard to the preservation of these uh, languages and ethnic cultures. Um, they um, come up uh, with uh, uh, certain um, thoughts and solutions. Uh, and uh, it is obvious from the video that uh, uh, these cultures have very vibrant uh, literary heritage that should be passed on to future generations and the nation, ancient culture of multinational tolerance and peaceful coexistence. Uh, uh, and uh, there is a lot to be learned from these uh, uh, wonderful uh, ethnicities and cultures. Um, and uh, the, I've already mentioned that the unit culminates in summative uh, assessment. And I think this is one of the um, successes uh, of this project. Um, in the summative assessment, students uh, were asked to create a video clip or report about their national identity or the multicultural diversity of their university environment. Uh, uh, the video clip uh, showcased their cultural, ethnic, uh, religious, linguistic diversity and um, uh, connected that diversity to uh, issues of identity and uh, multiculturalism discussed throughout the unit, such as the issues of preservation of ethnic heritage, belonging and uh, uh, cultural uh, assimilation. And uh, uh, in the process of working on this project, many students had an opportunity to reconnect with their ethnic roots by interviewing their family members, friends and relatives. They learned more about their ancestors, uh, cultural heritage and family traditions, which will uh, undoubtedly help them in the future with the issues of self-identity, ethnicity, multiculturalism and uh, uh, personal uh, values. Uh, many of them produced very impactful and touching videos where they talked about the importance of their uh, family cultural heritage and what it meant to them personally. So here's a, a quick clip from uh, one of these videos. Thank you, Ashley. <clears throat> Наследие, очень важно для личности и чувства принадлежности. Because it, it's really vital, I think, to have a knowledge of your own traditions mm -hmm. and cultures. And, and to have the lost is very sad because mm -hmm. what do we have left? Cultura, tradizii and yazik saedinyayut nas nashemi siemimi in nashemi karniami. Ani krasivia i abedinyayut nas vsesha. Mnie interesna kak by izmenilas zizn babushki, jesli by jej bela možna uchastvovat v jo kulturie. И мне интересно, как бы изменилась моя жизнь, если бы все традиции моих предков сохранились в нашей семье. К сожалению, я никогда этого не узнаю. And uh, to end uh, my presentation, uh, I'd like to quote a couple of um, 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 uh, thoughts uh, that my students shared with me on the uh, evaluations um, uh, um, uh, um, forms. Um, here's one of them. The, uh, the unit on multicultural diversity was a more than welcome addition to the course, allowing us to explore Russia's ethnic minorities through language, which was an invaluable experience and allowed us to form and, exp and express our own opinions in Russian and to access Russian language material pertaining to culture, identity, ethnicity, and customs that further enhanced our learning experience. The assignments we worked on in that unit and throughout the course were always engaging and felt intentionally structured to complement our in-class uh, work while also allowing us to explore outside perspectives and another opinion. I'm not sure if this is already something that will happen, but I would love to see the multicultural diversity unit become a permanent addition to the course going forward. It was one of the highlights of the semester and motivated me to explore so much more about Russia as a complex nation composed of many distinct cultures, identities, and religions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Nadia. And now we'll move to Stephanie Anderson, uh, who wrote a, a unit um, in Portuguese. Okay. Uh, I think we have at least one person joining us from Brazil. So, hola, boa tarde, bem-vindo. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Stephanie Anderson. And yeah, so I wrote a unit about o Brasileiro. Uh, 
basically Brazilian slam poetry. It was really fun for me to do. Um, most of my Portuguese exposure and experience comes from Portugal. And so it was really fun to kind of learn about this and then continue to learn along with the students as we went through this lesson. So Usarao is started in the periferia, so the outskirts of big cities like Sao Paulo, um, where traditionally the most marginalized people live. Um, and we see that this is poetry, using poetry as an instrument of political and culture resistance. We see themes of um, Rate, uh, you know, the poetry that addresses themes around racism, violence, misogyny, homophobia, poverty, and these these poems and these poetry slams they challenge the idea uh, of who can be an author, what is literature, and who decides this. So, challenging kind of those dominant culture ideas of what literature is. There are now hundreds of setouts throughout Brazil, and really all ages participate. Um, the next slide I have, we're going to watch a video of, um, it's just about 30, 40 seconds of Usarao da Cuaperifa, which is one of the oldest Saraos in Brazil. Uh, the person that is performing is Sergio Vaz, and he is uh, credited with kind of starting this Sarao movement. So I'd like you to notice both how he performs, but also just kind of the the what you can see of the um, setting. So these are often very informal settings where just a lot of people come together. So, all right, about 30 seconds, please, Ashley. Vitor nasceu no Jardim das Margaridas. Erva da Ninha nunca teve primavera. Cresceu sem pai, sem mãe, sem norte, sem serva. Pés no chão, nunca teve bicicleta. Já algo não nasceu, estreou. Pele branquinha, nunca teve inverno. Tinha pai, mãe, caderno e fada madrinha. Vitor virou ladrão. Hugo, salafrário. Um roubava pro pão, o outro pra reforçar o salário. Um usava capuz, o outro gravava. Um roubava na luz, o outro em noite de serenata. Um vivia de cativeiro, o outro de negócio. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so a bit about the unit, just overview. So this was implemented in a fourth semester Portuguese language course. Um, it took about 11 to 13 days, but you could certainly, you know, you can always take more time. The essential questions I looked at were, what does it mean to be a marginalized group or community in modern Brazilian society? How has slam poetry or the sarau addressed experiences of marginalization and suffering and offered a voice to people to express their challenges as well as their pride? And then turning it toward the students, how can you address issues of social justice, social injustice through your own original poetry? We included a lot of different authentic texts in the unit, videos, poetry, podcasts, news report, newspaper articles, uh, governmental websites. And this, uh, this, it, we looked at, uh, the unit looked at several social justice standards, but two that I want to sh uh, just share today, um, the diversity standard, what, um, sorry. I'm sorry, <laughs> I, the slides are I acting up for me. The slides. <laughs> There we go. Um, so um, this was, I believe, Nadia looked at this one as well, examine diversity in social, cultural, political, and historical context rather than in ways that are just superficial or oversimplified. And the identity, one of the identity standards we looked at um, was recognizing traits of the dominant culture, of the students' dominant culture, their home culture, and other cultures, and understanding how um, students and others negotiate their identity in multiple spaces. Um, okay, so yes, so setting the stage day one, I just want to share with you kind of how the unit starts because students see that, you know, that video that I shared with you is one of the first things students see and it can be maybe a little overwhelming, especially for our, our typical students here at the University of Minnesota. So I had them just reflect on what do you think about with Poetry Slam? What do you think about when I tell you we're going to do a Poetry Slam? And also this idea that for some students, it might be um, one of the first times that um, they have a unit that's really digging into and focusing on social justice and naming things like racism, um, naming things like like misogyny and sexism, et cetera. Um, so we, you know, I had students reflect on that. What it, and then as a class, we kind of came up with our own working definition of social justice. 
And then the final project um, for the unit was that students wrote their own poetry and they performed it. And then they created a poster that, that advertised the poetry slam. And on the day of the slam, the posters were on the door welcoming people because we did invite some other people to come to our slam. So I wanna show you a bit of the results um, when we worked with the posters. So this, this kind of progression took about two or three days. We started with, I asked students to find examples of social justice posters in our university community. Um, and you can see that, you know, they found one about climate action. This was last, so last spring. So there was, and well, this is still relevant today, but stop the war in Ukraine and then support undergrad or support graduate workers who are trying to unionize. So we, we looked at those and we talked about things like font and size of font and colors and words um, and how, you know, what the creators of these posters did to really make their, their issues stand out. And then we went and we looked at several examples of um, set of advertising for posters for set outs. And then that fine, and we talked about those same kind of things. What vocab do we see? What font, color, et cetera? to get the message across. And then with the with the purpose of that being students designing their own poster. And this is an example. Um, and so you can see kind of some of the same elements that we looked at in this final example. I've got two examples of poetry that I'd like to share with you and before I conclude my part. So here's an example of um, one of the poems that a student wrote that I think really gets at this idea of advocacy. This student is um, had a job in water conservation and his job was was knocking on doors, talking to people. So this is just an excerpt, um, his writing, and he talks about going door to door and he's talking to people. And he even like knocked on the door when he was performing his 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 poem, you know, and he says, don't you think it's sad what's happening with our water? Our water is turning bad. And then the other example I want to share with you, this was a BIPOC student who wrote a, po wrote a poem celebrating identity and celebrating difference, right? And he's asking about like, oh, what a great place. You know, can we imagine a place where respect is reciprocal when we, we guarantee everyone's humanity? And also he says, you know, but not a place where we don't see differences, but rather recognize that differences really are our greatest strengths. So um, that was that was a bit about our set out. I really enjoyed it. I learned a ton along with the students. So I'm going to pass it along to Ashley now um, to share her unit. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm happy to share with you all the unit that I designed for my French course. It is titled Proud to be Franco Louisianan, and it explores linguistic security and pride in Francophone Louisiana where the use of French has a tumultuous and minoritized history. Throughout this unit, students relate the, these perspectives to their own lived experiences and linguistic identities in powerful and meaningful ways. Furthermore, students analyze initiatives that hinder or promote linguistic security um, and then create and pitch their own social media campaign on the same themes. In this image here on the screen, you can see a similar example of a language promotion campaign that was used in the 1970s before the age of Instagram where Code of Field, which is a government agency that we'll talk about again later in this uh, presentation, uh, pre created these placards that businesses and uh, individuals could post in their windows to say that we are proud to speak French here. <clears throat> um, okay, so this unit was uh, designed and piloted with third semester French students at the University of Minnesota. During the pilot semester, the majority of students were L1 English speakers from the upper Midwest in the United States, though there was a variety of backgrounds in the class as well. Um, this unit is guided by uh, two essential questions. Um, how are the languages that we speak a part of our identities? <clears throat> and why is linguistic security and or pride important and how can communities um, promote it? In order to explore these questions, we uh, use a wide range of French language texts from Canada and Louisiana, including video reports, news articles, two poems such as um, Schizophrenie Linguistique or uh, Linguistic Schizophrenia by John Arsenault and a translingual multimodal poem titled I Walk With Words. We also uh, looked at websites and Instagram posts from a Louisiana cultural center as well as Code Field, that government agency that we were mentioning, um, whose charge is to protect uh, French in Louisiana. And finally, we finished the content of the unit with a full length documentary um, called Le Choix de Théo or Theo's Choice. Um, throughout the unit, there are numerous formative and summative assessments. 
Um, and it, but it concludes with the most significant summative and action oriented assessment, which is uh, in which groups create Instagram campaigns that advocate for linguistic pride and recruits candidates <clears throat> to, um, uh, to a Codo field program for aspiring French immersion teachers. Um, before we dive into the details more of this unit, I, I would like to frame this discussion through two of the social justice standards. Um, the first is a, a standard from the justice domain, and this standard seeks to equip students to recognize unfairness on the individual level, such as biased speech, and injustice on the institutional or systemic level, level such as discrimination. And then the second one is from the action domain, um, which seeks to equip students to plan and carry out collective action against bias and injustice in the world, and will evaluate what strategies are most effective. I think these two standards have a nice balance or um, uh, complement each other very nicely, and that the first um, identifies injustice and the second makes a plan to take action against that injustice. Um, here's sort of a, a overview of the unit, a unit at a glance and the timeline of, uh, of sort of how it is spaced out. Um, it does, it is designed for 13 days in class, although you can always um, either pick and choose pieces of it or um, expand upon it as you see fit and or you can fit in other things throughout. We um, uh, did that a little bit and when we piloted it as well. Um, but to go back to those justice standards, the first, um, uh, the social justice standards, the justice standard, um, it was examined thoroughly in the early and mid phases of the unit. We started by defining linguistic insecurity by questioning who is a legitimate speaker of French. Through testimonies of Canadian minority French speakers from outside of Quebec, <clears throat> we hear of anxiety, embarrassment, and feelings of illegitimacy with their language use. Students often related to these emotions in their, in their own experiences of learning French, and therefore they deeply connected with the content. But we also quickly distinguished their experience from that of minoritized native or heritage speakers of French. Um, the Franco-Louisianan experience here on days six and seven um, was illustrated through a few um, powerful texts. One was the Arsenault poem that I mentioned earlier, which movingly recounts the impacts of English only policies in the early 20th century in Louisiana. A French 24, a France 24 report, which emphasizes the central role the French language has in Cajun identity in Louisiana. And the full length documentary, Le Choix de Théo, which gives deeper historical accounting, including the language preservation and promotion efforts since the 1970s. It also documents the current decisions by young adults, including Théo, uh, the, uh, who's named in the title, to become French immersion school teachers as an effort to promote French in their communities. I highly recommend this documentary, it is very powerful. Um, and then from understanding both the individual unfairness and the systemic injustice through language policies, um, from there we then turn to the action uh, standard. Um, so after studying and analyzing how others could and have taken action in Louisiana on days three through five, um, <clears throat> students start to create their own social media campaigns to these ends. And here is the scenario for that project. Um, imagine that you are interns with Codofil, the state agency charged with the promotion of French in Louisiana. As a part of your internship, you must create a social media campaign that is based on the theme of Francophone pride in order to promote one of Codofil's programs, Escredit Louisiane. This program promotes French in Louisiana by recruiting university students to become teachers of French in immersion schools. You are going to propose your campaign in a presentation to the director of Code of Field, role played by your instructor, and the other interns, your classmates. Um, but before and as they endeavor in this project, the unit equips students with a functional understanding of some important linguistic tools and conventions. We spend a lot of time talking about metaphor, the use of infinitives as a subject of a sentence or of a verb, um, translanguaging practices and perspectives, bilingual text development, vocabulary about emotions, advocacy, and language promotion, and Louisianan terms and expressions, idiomatic expressions. Um, I'll conclude my time today by sharing one of the examples of a student project. This group, uh, again, they were creating a social media campaign on Instagram. So they all created a one sample post and then um, in their presentation expanded on how this would make a series. And for this one, they said, they started with, don't drop the potato. Do you recognize this say saying? Swipe left to learn more. Ne lâche pas la patate is a Franco-Louisianan expression for don't give up. So learning French is hard, but Codofil can help. And then the final slide says, be proud, sois fier. Even if you are not fluent in French, you are Franco-Louisianne and you should not lâche pas la patate in your French journey. Cheers to being yourself 
hashtag Codophile. And they um, uh, attached to these images, they added this caption, um, which is bilingual on purpose as it reflects the um, bilingual uh, Instagram posts that we had studied throughout the chapter. And here they explain, so you've never heard of this Franco-Louisianan expression before? Oh, mon chéri, mm -hmm. our post is here to educate. There is no shame in learning, even when you don't have the patates. <laughs> I mean, we don't have the potatoes. You are passionate about Franco-Louisiana culture. Please, can, or if you are passionate about Franco-Louisiana culture, please consider applying for Code of Fils Escrédit Louisiane. Um, in French here, it just is translating those same ideas. Um, these students expertly modeled their post after some that we had analyzed during the unit. And they included a lot of idiomatic expressions from Louisiana, translanguaging practices and metaphor. They also did an excellent job pitching their campaign in a presentation that displayed what they had learned about linguistic security and pride. Um, overall, this unit has been powerful and moving and the pilot was so successful that we have given it a permanent place in our third semester course. And it is one of my highlights of the semester to watch the new posts pop up on Instagram, <laughs> on our class Instagram page. Um, but uh, yeah, so, um, so that's a little bit about my, about my unit. Uh, thank you for letting me share about this unit today. And now I'll pass the baton to Sarah Finney, who will share about her title, uh, her unit titled Artistic Expressions of Cultural and Individual Identity. Thank you, Ashley. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about my Spanish unit, which is focused on lots of things, art, activism, identity, advocacy, and action. Um, so I'll start with my essential question. So what, what we're guiding my unit here. So the first essential question is what can art forms show us or allow us to show others about historical injustice, culture, and or identity? And I kept that in intentionally broad because I really wanted students to be able to activate their own agency and how they engaged with the content of this unit. The second one is how can art be used to raise awareness and or inspire social, social action, which relates to our final project, which I'll share in a second. Um, but here's a unit, here's my unit at a glance. So um, as you can see, there are five sort of lessons or components, and they're separated by genre. So the first three focus on poetry, song, and a painting. And then we do a gallery walk, which is essentially where students go around to different stations in their classroom and experience and identify um, different types of art with social justice undertones, and then what kind of artistic strategies those artists use to convey certain messages. And all of that is sort of building blocks to the final project, which is actually where I'm going to start with us today. Um, I want you all to see how, how students share of themselves, their identities, their interests as they created their final project. Um, and, and then we'll kind of go back and look at one of the units at to see sort of how it builds together. Um, so what was, the, what was their final project? Students had to create a piece of art and there were two criteria. The first is it had to educate, inform, inspire, or raise awareness. And the second was that it had to represent part of their identity or something that they stood for. So you might be thinking that um, your students are not art students. And I think some of my students thought that as well when I presented this first uh, project to them. And some were really excited about this, but others were coming up to me and saying, Profe, I don't, I don't know how to draw even a stick figure. Am I gonna pass my Spanish class? So of course I reassured them. We had lots of options and, and um, time along the way for them to formulate their ideas. And here on the slide, I told them they could do any range of art that we saw in class, but also they could expand in other ways. Um, to do something that was called their name. And so again, just wanting them to feel that they could do something that was important or relevant to them. So I just wanna say that in the end, even um, the most, there were the least artistic students really created something powerful to share. And, and I think the cool thing was that it related again to their own interests and proclivities. Um, one thing I want to mention is I didn't grade their art. So that, I think that's important to mention. Uh, I'm not grading anyone on their artistic ability. Instead, it was a completion grade. And so there was another component to their final project, which I gave them a scenario and um, basically said, okay, you've created an original work of art. Now I want you to share your, you want to share your art on Instagram. And so to do that, you're going to write out a, basically an Instagram post talking about your 
the artistic strategies that you used in your art, okay? Um, and it's a longer Instagram post because this was a third semester Spanish course, but those of you who use Instagram, it's, I think, pretty common to have long posts. So, um, so that was their, what, the, what was graded, and we looked at lots of texts mirroring artistic descriptions throughout the unit. So I want to show you all before I move forward some of what students created for their art to give you a sense of if you, you were to use this unit where your students would end up. So the first sample um, on the next slide here is on identity. So this student um, was a Mexican American student and I'm not going to read this whole poem called the in between I'm just going to read the little excerpt that is translated fully into English on the right there so it says what is your ethnicity they ask. I'm half white and half Mexican, I reply. Do you speak Spanish, they ask? No, I do not know how to speak Spanish, I reply. But if you do, don't know Spanish, then you are not real Mexican, they say. So here she's sort of grappling with her own identity. And this was one of my lower performing students in that particular class, but she told me that this was the highlight of her semester, um, that semester. So that was really encouraging. Um, the other one is similar. And this was another Mexican-American student in my class who has symbolism, you can see on the left and right, related to her Mexican and, and United States identities, some speech bubbles in the middle with different things that have been said or that she's heard, some of them derogatory. So you can see these students grappling with their own identity and raising awareness of what it might mean to be a Mexican-American. Um, and they described in their writing all of the symbolism that you're seeing and maybe can um, intuit what it might mean, but they they described it really beautifully. So this next uh, set of projects, uh, this student, these students were obviously my more artistically inclined students, and the one on the left, the student talked about how she had a sister who was schizophrenic, and she wanted to raise awareness of what it's like to live with mental illness. And um, again, you can see she discussed all this symbolism that she has in this piece um, in her writing. It was really beautiful. And similarly on the right, another student highlighting mental illness, illness which was a very popular topic actually among my students this semester. Um, and a lot of symbolism there as well. She has some words written in there and between the clouds and such. And so students get to share what they incorporated into their art and what it means to them. So. And a couple more examples. So this was more advocacy related um, as far as the environment. So you probably can't tell, but on the left, that is a cake. So my student asked me if he could bake a cake and I talked with him a little bit about it, making sure he'd be able to write his post and he did phenomenal. And so the outside of the cake rec represents an environment that is not thriving and the inside is our environment that's sustainable and thriving. And so there's lots of contrast and um, the red around. So anyway, and then of course the other one on the right is also about the environment as well by another student. And then one more, this one is for the less artistically inclined students, a collage beautifully done and she uh, focused on equality and women's rights. So that gives you a sense of what students really can do and it's he heavily scaffolded if you look into my module, lots of scaffolding. So um, before I end, I just want to share quickly um, a little bit about one of the units that um, I think would be helpful just as a glimpse. So the poetry unit on day one and two is where I'm gonna start. And our focus there was the genre of poetry, obviously, and then discrimination and identity were our topics. So um, over the course of about two days, our first piece of art was a poem written by this young lady here that's pictured. And you did see that one student wrote a poem and several students actually wrote poems. So this is sort of their model text of what can your poem look like? What are we looking for? And the poet who's pictured here is an intentionally unconventional poet, right? A young woman who wrote about her love for her hometown in Coyolillo, Veracruz, Mexico. And students analyzed what strategies she used, such as rhyming, vivid imagery, repetition, they talked about it in Spanish. That's part of it, right? The scaffolding. And then the analysis that we used was to help students explicitly think about, okay, how could I use these artistic strategies in my own art, right? Um, and then students connected this poem to their own lives in their own cities of origin and the mixed feelings that may come with that are positive 
and negative. And then they explored in this middle column on the slide, um, they explored some of the history of Coyolillo, which is that they have a carnival that celebrates Afro-Mexican culture, but uh, that came from um, some historic racism that has been sort of reimagined by the community and, um, and created an empowered narrative toward change. So students examined all of this in two days, and that was their first foray into this unit. Um, so I wanna just stop there, even though there's so much more I think all of us could share because these units are very, very rich. Um, the, I, you're gonna see similar social justice standards here for my unit on poetry, again, recognizing unfairness at specifically the systemic level there, and then um, moving beyond the superficial or the oversimplified. So um, those were the two I addressed in the poetry lesson. And all of the presenters, I think, have given us a quick glimpse into these units. And we really hope some of you will explore on your own um, parts of these units, all of these units, figure out how they could work for your own context. Go in and glance at these videos. Go in and glance at the um, Coyolillo video on um, their Afro-Mexican celebration during the carnival. I mean, these are there's really cool text in all of our um, units. And uh, we really want everyone to, to know they're there and use them if they fit your context. So if you were to go and say, I wanna explore some of these here, um, you'll go and you'll see, like these are three that you heard today, right? Russian, French, and Portuguese, you heard all of those. There's a link right there. If you click on it, like I clicked on the Russian link there, um, it'll just open up a Google, a Google Drive. And there you have access to everything, slideshows, handouts, videos, all the things. So please go take a look at that. Um, very simple to access. And then lastly, I just wanna say um, a very special thank you to those who supported us in this journey, specifically Kate Paisani, who's here today leading this, Karen, who helped us get everything set up, and Carla, and then all of our reviewers and consultants. We're so thankful um, to you for your help. And lastly, for those of you who may want to explore these units, you'll see in the bottom left, I have included a tiny URL and a QR code. That will take you to this slideshow. And then right below there, you see we have access to all curricular unit materials. I think Kate put it in the chat as well. We really are wanting you to have access to that. So um, with that, I'm gonna open it up for questions. And I just wanna thank you all again so much for being here. Thanks, Sarah, Ashley, and Nadia and Stephanie. I, I hope everybody in the audience can hear your passion when you're talking about these units. And as someone who went in and observed multiple class periods during the piloting of these units, I can also attest to the students' enthusiasm about these units. If you have any doubts about whether or not intermediate level or second year language students can do this kind of complex social justice work, your doubts, I hope, are assuaged now because they really did such a good job. And you can see that in the final products that were shared today. So in relation to those final products, there was one question from Beth um, about how many days roughly students spend working on that final assessment. Sarah, you had mentioned that this is all sort of scaffolded for them, but maybe, and some of you did provide timeline, but just kind of roughly, like how long does it take students to go from learning about what the final assessment is to actually having a final product. I would say I'll start. For me, it was pretty much the whole unit. So we started with saying, hey, we're going to do this. And then about three or four days in, it said, OK, I want you to start thinking about your final project. What might work for you? This is not you don't have to commit. And then a couple of days later. So we kept asking them and kind of pushing them to think it through. And then we started getting more detailed. What artistic strategies might you use? And so it was really heavily scaffolded almost throughout the entire unit for mine. It was very similar uh, for me as well. I um, encouraged my students to start thinking about the final project uh, from the very beginning. Um, they did have a week to prepare for it. We covered the first three chapters in 10 days, and then they had uh, another week to prepare for the final project. We looked at the existing uh, videos uh, that I found uh, um, on the uh, Russian site uh, 
um, uh, where there were similar projects done. Um, uh, and uh, it was a contest of national uh, uh, video clips, uh, national uh, contest. So they had a good model. We talked about the genre conventions. We had brainstorming sessions. We drafted the script. So, and that took about a week. And at the end of the week, they had a chance to film uh, and produce the videos. And many of them came up with amazing videos, uh, um, you know, up to 10 uh, and over minutes uh, in length. <laughs> So <clears throat> I would say that mine is also similar. Um, I didn't actually talk about what the final project would be until probably mid or mid unit or so. But um, as we like explored sort of the experiences of people in Louisiana and the like, then we also talked about like, well, what is being done to like promote and promote linguistic pride? So we showed like some Instagram posts as like a, hey, this is a solution. And this is a solution that's working. And so we kind of um, analyzed that text for its content and sort of how it was um, being effective for promoting linguistic pride. And then we watched the documentary and then shortly after then we started our week long um, preparation for the social uh, for the social media campaigns we're talking through and then we really broke down okay what are all the different pieces of this instagram post and how do they go together and so then scaffolded all their um, their work towards the, their own uh, posts for the project yeah and i should mention that um these units were developed using a backward design approach so yeah. all of the curriculum developers determined excuse me determined learning objectives first and then had to kind of think about what the summative assessment would be. It was challenging for you all to do that. I think we had some group work sessions where people were pulling their hair out a little bit over what that was going to be, but it's really nice to hear you talk about the fact that you introduced the assessment early on in the unit because um, it sort of um, reinforces that idea of backward design too so that students know where they're going by the end of the unit. Um, there's one more question here that I think we have time for and that is about um, challenges from your students as you were implementing the units. So here's the question. Have you encountered any challenges or resistance from students such as reluctance, reluctance to expose themselves um, or tech limitations in creating videos, anything like that? I mean, I think that the one thing I wanted to make sure was to allow students to really do what they felt comfortable with, not pressure them into one thing. So I think that really helped to not have as many. I'm sure there were students, I suspect, that didn't love this topic because maybe they're not as passionate, but they were by far in the minority. I think if, if so, maybe one or two that I suspected was a little bit disengaged at times. But for the most part, I think students overwhelmingly loved the unit. I, I agree with Sarah. I think uh, uh, first, maybe some students, uh, just a few of them, um, had some kind of apprehension. I wouldn't call it resistance, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, whether they had anything valuable to share. Um, uh, but when they got into this uh, project, uh, they were uh, actually very uh, surprised themselves to see um, uh, how much uh, they have to share with uh, other students and uh, um, uh, how important this topic uh, is for their um, identity. And uh, when they delved into it and started exploring and coming in touch with uh, their um, their family members, their grandparents, their parents, and talking about it. Many of them came at the end to me and said, well, thank you for this opportunity because um, we uh, never thought about it uh, before and never realized that, uh, you know, it was so, so important to us. Uh, um, well, um, so, yes, I, I think it was overall a uh, very positive uh, response. Um, <clears throat> Um, I can also speak to like the the tech side of that question, because um, it is true that I think almost all of these projects included a decent amount of technology in sort of their presentation of the projects. And I remember specifically, I had a student who was a traditional undergraduate student who um, he's like, I never use social media. So I kind of don't, I, he really didn't have the same level of background knowledge as other, as some other students in the classroom did. But um, a few things that we did to sort of to kind of overcome any of that was that it was built in in the um in the project phase all of the, that week of preparation before they turned in their project um there was both like okay here are here's what a post looks like here are all of its pieces here's what, how the pieces work together and what the function of each of these pieces are and how we use them into that kind of deeper genre analysis 
And then um, also they were working in groups. So they didn't, if one person had more expertise than another, then they could kind of uh, bring their expertises together on how to um, create the final project. And um, we also uh, worked in like a homework assignment was of um, like, here is a tutorial on how to use Canva for creating these kinds of graphics. And if you, and it was, it was a little bit like um, you could sort of self, you self-assessed um, how proficient you were with Canva. And if you needed help, then you did it all. But then they had to turn in like a simple, like here's an image that I could use in my thing, in my uh, thing that was just basically, it could even just say like, hi, and that's it. But, you know, to work out with the technology tools um, as homework in advance. So those kinds of things helped scaffold it. Well, we've reached the end of our time together. I do want to mention that um, the link that we have put in the chat to the actual curricular units also includes units, uh, other units in French, units in German, and uh, a unit in Arabic. And coming soon, we will also have curricular units in Turkish and Chinese. So that will be in the next few months that we'll be posting those. And all of those curricular units are published as open educational resources, which means that you can make copies of them, you can adapt them to fit your needs, um, and do whatever you like with them. So we really want these to be flexible tools that teachers can use to fit within their own classroom uh, affordances and constraints. So I want to once again, thank Sarah, Ashley, Nadia, and Stephanie. And for I wanna thank all of you for coming today. And we look forward to seeing you at a Carla presentation soon.